everyone, and welcome to today's edition of our Seven Investing Podcast, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson. I'm really excited to be joined by our partners at Chit Chat Money today, other long term investors who share a lot of the same perspectives on the stock market as I do. That's Brett Schaefer and Ryan Henderson. They're joining me today for our podcast. They're also the two portfolio managers of Arch Capital. Uh, Brett and Ryan, hey, nice to meet you guys. And nice to meet, <laughs> nice to see you guys again. It's always a pleasure check, checking in with you every couple of months. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, definitely happy to be here. We, we've got a, a bunch of topics we could talk about. We could always talk about the, you know, the volatility of the market and interest rates going up and stuff like that. But I always like to kind of dig a little bit deeper into some of the sectors and even the companies that you guys like. And uh, maybe even have a 10,000 foot kind of overall discussion as well. And so we're going to jump into gaming a little bit later on the podcast. But the 10,000 foot discussion I wanted to start with was on stock-based compensation. Uh, this is something that when times are good and it's 2021 and, you know, it's step your foot on the accelerator, you know, growth at any cost. This is not something that gets a whole lot of attention, right? Investors kind of glance over it and say, okay, it's fine. Silicon Valley can pay these guys with a ton of money in stock. But now this is something that's becoming more and more important for a variety of different reasons. Uh, let me just throw it to you guys. What are your thoughts on stock-based compensation? And maybe how is that a little different today versus a year or two ago? Well, anyone that's listened to our show on Chit Chat Money knows that I am not a huge fan of stock-based compensation. Um, I uh, definitely prefer cash. And there's I guess we can go into the deeper details of say, you know, the difference between when the stock's soaring and kind of, you know, what companies are doing now with their stocks down, say maybe 80% or something like that, repricing, stuff like that. But the reason I like cash, if a company can do it compared to stock-based compensation is one, it's so much simpler. It's simpler for employees, it's simpler for management and it's simpler for shareholders to track. And two, SBC, or options or giving people ownership, you know, directly instead of letting them decide whether they want to be a shareholder in your company themselves, puts leverage on your stock price that you wouldn't have if you're paying people in cash. So I get that some companies need to, you know, if they're um, they're a startup or they're burning money, growing quickly, it can be an advantage to use stock. And I'm not against investing in a company that uses heavy stock-based compensation. We're invested in companies that use heavy stock-based compensation. But it's definitely a little light for me. And I think in general, those are kind of the two main things. And I know there's obviously more um, specific things for, you know, a lot of tech companies whose stocks might be down 50, 70 percent right now. Yeah. I mean, there's like the. Yeah. Brett, Brett's probably more against it, I guess. than I, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not the biggest fan of it, but the uh, there is that side to it, the personal side where you feel just I mean, it, your, well, your bonus is diminished or you, you thought it was going to be worth more because you decided to take options as an employee. And there is, I imagine, kind of a, a knock on morale at the company when there's something like that, especially when everyone at the company is uh, has been incentivized with stock. Um, we're starting to see, I think, a lot of examples where top talent at some of the bigger tech firms are leaving uh, because you know they don't see the opportunity there, or, um, and leaving for mega cap uh, like Fang potentially. I guess that's kind of the worry for a lot of these people because we've seen uh, who was it? I believe Microsoft like doubled their mid level salary or something like that. And these Fang companies or, or Fan Mag, whatever the mega cap techs, they have so much cash on the balance sheet. Um, their stock prices have only gone down by say like fifteen to twenty percent they can offer way, way better pay, even if you're more, you know, going to be in more bureaucracy maybe, or you're going to be in a larger company that uh, it might not be the job you dreamed of. In this environment, you might like, like that better than say, well, do you have that DocuSign example, Ryan, of everyone leaving? Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, I believe it's sales rep, sales reps at DocuSign have been leaving this year. And I believe that's part of the reason why Dan Springer ended up resigning here recently. And they talked about it on the last conference call uh, and they were basically asked, you know, like, why do you see so many sales reps quitting? And Dan Springer said, uh, one, I do think the most substantial component for us and pretty much everyone I talked to in the software world is this construct that equity values are clearly down pretty much across the board with the reassessment of multiples. If you would have paid 
those employees or bonuses in cash, I think they would have been just as incentivized prior and you probably wouldn't have, uh, I guess, tied your ship to the stock price in, in the way that they have. And I don't know, it just, it never feels like a giant problem when things are going well, but you can see how much of a risk it presents when things start to go poorly. And uh, I think DocuSign has kind of been one example in that case. That's not, I don't know the business that well, but one case where morale at the company has kind of deteriorated because of this, this tie-in with stock price. It makes a lot of sense, especially when you're talking about those cloud native, you know, fast growing tech companies. We always like to talk about the price to sales ratio of their, and then a lot of the common commentary is, is how awesome their cash flow margins look too, right? Especially free cash flow margins. But like this discussion in particular points out some of the holes in that thinking, right? You know, you take back out stock-based compensation and it's not an issue when things are going great. Your margins look fantastic. Your cash flow margins look fantastic. But then you realize, you know, this was kind of what a lot of people were counting on to sell that stock uh, for X dollars. And now it's X minus Y dollars of what this is actually worth. Uh, that tends to tick off your sales force for a lot of the time. Um, especially for companies like DocuSign, like you mentioned there, Ryan, um, you know, these companies that are adapting and it's not so easy to close deals when budgets, um, you know, kind of, kind of slow down and uh, you've got COVID still kind of lingering. It's not so easy to get sales like it was in 2019 or 2018, especially when money was free too. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, this is definitely something that we need to evaluate in the tech world are there certain companies that you think are either doing a good job or a bad job at managing their stock-based compensation right now, in addition to DocuSign, like you just mentioned, who's maybe not doing a real good job with it right now? Ooh, good job. I don't know if I have any examples. Um, well, okay, here's the- It uh, helps when the stock doesn't move that much. Okay, here's, I think it's, it's always cost. helpful when you generate positive cash. So, you know- if someone ha generates positive cash flow, they have the ability to pay people in cash. Okay, here's the, the prime example who's been the best example ever is the Constellation software model where they require, you know, they pay people in cash. They don't uh, do any stock-based compensation. Their share count has stayed the same forever. And they require people, I believe it's every employee. Um, I'm not a deep expert on the company, but or say from a certain like level up to, you know, the executive team. They require people to be owners of the stock, but they pay people in cash. So you, you know, you have the freedom of having the cash, but you also get people skin in the game, which, are, you know, you get worried about when you're only paying someone in dollars that might be not be tied to the long-term business success poorly. Um, well, I don't know if I have exact examples, except for maybe Peloton who repriced a bunch of their options, but I don't know if that's even a bad thing because I think it's something they're maybe forced to do because they made the mistake of tying so much of their compensation to their stock in the past. So to keep people around, they're going to have to reprice their options lower. And I guess just to explain that, um, typically when you know someone has, gets a stock option, you're only allowed to vest that if the stock price is above your grant, uh, whatever price, the price strike they give price. you, the strike price. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and with Peloton, since their stock is really, really in the tank, it's way, way below a lot of people's strike prices. So those would most likely expire worthless. And now Peloton is coming in and saying, we can reprice you lower to around where the current share price is. Now, is that good for keeping employees around? Yes. Or is there something they may have to do? Yes, but is it bad for shareholder dilution? Also, yes. So I think that's something you have to wear, uh, be wary of or uh, cognizant of as an investor. Like, I, I don't know if Peloton could do anything better, but it's just not, if you're making any sort of model or any sort of projections on what, you know, earnings per share will be, free cash flow per share will be, or, you know, what, where the stock price could be in five years, hence, or 10 years from now, it's going to be lower all else equal if they're if they're diluting you more at these lower prices. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, fortunately, there's probably a lot of bad examples now in the world um, in sort of the tech world of companies that uh, 
not necessarily anchored to their stock price or, or let it like validate them as a company, but they just used it to, as we've kind of talked about, they, they gave it to employees in a sense, in, in a way that made them the employees sort of anchor to it. So it's not, I mean, it isn't necessarily the end of the world, but no one wants to be, no one wants to say, yeah, I'll take half the bonus that I had last year or a quarter of the bonus for the same amount of options. So it's either going to be more dilutive or they're going to have, they're going to say, no, I don't want stock. I've seen what the performance, I, unfortunately, a lot of employees look at stock-based compensation retrospectively. So they're saying last year, my options were worthless now when I took them or whatever, however many years it was ago, I, I think I'll take cash. So suddenly the stock-based compensation line item on your cash flow statement becomes a cash charge. And so, um, or worse, there's, there's more dilution or, or they just get worse bonuses and people feel like they want to leave. I think a company that actually did fairly well, and I, I'm not even going to say this one because I might get it wrong, but companies that use their stock to acquire other companies during the bubble, um, or can, can we say bubble? Is that, well, is, is I don't know. Jury's out. Jury, uh, I mean, it was a much more advantageous time to do so, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. With higher premium prices. Right. Right. And I think, unless I'm wrong, I think Shopify did a few equity offerings. They did. Um, yeah, they did. Well, they didn't, I didn't buy anyone um, with it, well, but they did yeah. the equity offerings and then they bought some companies later. Yeah. And I mean, Tesla to some extent raised Tesla, a lot yeah, of Yeah, they did. Yeah. They used that as well. Um, I mean, <laughs> using. You can't. You can you can try your hardest to keep your valuation uh, like generally within a reasonable range, which is ideally what you do. Buffett's tried to do it pretty much his whole career, so it never gets too out of hand. But you saw, I mean, Elon Musk even essentially, whether he tried to do it or not, said, you know, stock price too high, IMO or whatever on that tweet, and the stock ripped afterwards. So th you can't really control what the open market thinks of your stock. So but you can control if you do an equity offering. Yeah. So, and you can control if you do an equity offering when your stock's expensive and then uh, you buy back stock when it is cheap. I think this time period, the last three years and probably uh, going over the next three years will be very good, say, tests for management teams, at least from my view, when I'm evaluating a management team, did they make decisions that I think were smart for long-term shareholders? Uh, because if their stock price is super volatile, I don't know if that's getting off topic, but is that, uh, does that make sense to you guys where like it, it can be helpful? It, it's kind of the perfect segue to, the, to where I wanted to bring this next, which is that we, you know, we talked about kind of the, uh, the employees and how important that is for Salesforce and stuff, but a huge portion of stock-based comp is going to executives too, right? We have seen it popularized in the last couple of years of CEOs accepting the bare minimum in salary that they possibly can and accept, accepting instead these enormous stock grants if they knock it out of the park, right? Maybe, maybe it was Steve Jobs. It was the first one to be like, I want a $1 salary, right? Mark Zuckerberg followed very uh, shortly after where Jack Dorsey, you know, at Twitter did the same thing. But even today, even in today's world, we're starting to see uh, other executives that are saying, I want to be paid in stock-based compensation or in options awards that are tied to something. And these are kind of one of two paths you take on this, right? One is the performance of the company reward. Elon Musk is going to get a huge payday if Tesla ships so many vehicles and the other you know, operational uh, metrics that are written into this. Uh, Tim Cook has something similar for Apple as well. But then you've also got some other executives that are tied to the stock price itself. Brett, I think this is kind of related to what you were just mentioning that, you know, when you have the uh, the Paul Goose of, of Upstart saying, you know, he's going to get a payday if Upstart's stock price hits a certain amount. Uh, Yex has a new CEO that's going to get a real payday if their stock price hits a certain level. You can do some earnings manipulation based on what the market wants you to do. And what Wall Street wants to see that may or may not be um, long-term sustainable for investors. And so I guess m m this is kind of my roundabout way of thinking of like, how do you want to see executives paid? Would you rather them take out a couple million dollars in cash every year for a performance reward? Or are you okay, or at least somewhat okay with, with these enormous paydays that are tied to either performance of the company or the stock price performance? Yeah, I think 
I have a lot of opinions on this one. Um, okay, so hitting on the the stock price one, that seems so sound because you're like, uh, you lay out a table, okay, we hit this stock price, the CEO will get this, everyone's aligned, right? We all want the stock price to be higher five or seven years from now. And I kind of like that model, but the only thing that concerns me is that it can hit it, say, and they usually have a thing of it has to be above it for 90 days or something like that, or 30 days or something like that. But that only means it needs to be above it for that time period. And if the stock rises super high and then falls back down, the executive can get the compensation just because the market was kind of in its manic, uh, well, maybe not depressive, manic exuberant state. And that, like, that makes that, uh, from my mind, that makes that sort of compensation plan just kind of a negative for me when I'm looking at a company. And then generally when we're looking at something, there's usually bonuses that are tied to some sort of metric a lot of the times. And we like to look and see whether we think there's going to be any issues where there's the, so or, say or an ex uh, multiple metrics, uh, multiple metrics. Yeah. It could be multiple metrics, percentage for each, blah, blah, blah. But the, it just can be a, a concerning thing. If say, for example, a company is, or sorry, an executive team is getting uh, compensated based on an adjusted EBITDA target, and then it's, it's stock-based compensation for that because you can, one, be heavily dilutive to your employee base to juice adjusted EBITDA, get your own stock grants, which get excluded out of adjusted EBITDA, and free cash flow per share which is, you know, the main thing that, you know, helps grow uh, shareholder value over the long term, that can be totally disregarded. So for us, and well, almost no companies use free cash flow per share for their, for their targets. So it's not like it's a deal breaker for us because you kind of got to be dealt, you know, you got to use the cards that you're dealt with, but it's definitely uh, a risk, we think, when the incentives are not aligned with us as outside shareholders. And the amount of dollars people are getting paid, I don't think that is a huge thing to focus on unless it's, you know, super egregious. It, it, it is what it is. Ideally, they're just founders. And, yeah, and then they don't they get paid. Just, <laughs> exactly. Start. That can be a huge positive. Uh, but yeah, it's always, I don't know, that's something that I've kind of always grappled with and I never have found like the perfect performance incentive because you want, I think a lot of uh like employees or executives, they probably want some consistency in their uh, compensation. Whereas if you use free cash flow per share, it might not be smooth enough to provide that consistency if that's like your performance metric. So maybe you just get paid really well in cash and then there's a, a bonus built on some sort of... Uh, well, I don't know if these executives are, you know, they're not going to be homeless if they don't get this bonus. Uh, usually their base salaries are uh, mid six figures, mid six figures minimum. Yeah, it's, I don't know, because like adjusted EBIT is not like the worst metric in the world. Oh, whoa, I mean. I, <laughs> what if it's purely revenue? You said EBIT and not earnings, Brett. Yeah, I mean, well, revenue, if, revenue could be worse, yes. Yeah, yeah you could sell things regard. like at a gigantic loss. Sure. So, I mean, I don't know, I, some, some mix of metrics and making sure it's just not completely egregious or, or too dilutive to shareholders. Yeah. I kind of like, yeah, the free cash flow can be tough because sometimes there's inventory, sometimes there's heavy capital investments. I mean, maybe, you know, a mix of gross profit and operating income seems very simple to me or operating both per share and you know, something like that. Yeah. Fantastic. It's, it's well, buyer beware. Buyer beware for any tech companies out there. I think you guys do some great work of actually like digging in, like you said, to adjusted earnings, adjusted EBITDA, see what's actually going on underneath the hood for a lot of these companies. It's going to be a lot harder to retain talent and also show profits for shareholders, especially with the climate we're in right now. Uh, let me shift gears a little bit. You know, gaming is kind of one of those topics. It's hot. Everyone's talking about the metaverse these days. Uh, but you guys actually have a lot of exposure and arch capital to gaming related companies. Um, tell us a little bit about why you're interested in this market sector and maybe some companies you're interested in there. Or anyone? Uh, as far as the companies that we are interested in or own, 
I, I believe the three gaming related ones that we own are Nintendo, Electronic Arts, and Take Two Interactive. Uh, um, what was the second part of your question? Sorry, I was blanking on it. Why? The rationale? Why, why gaming? What's the state of gaming? You know, we talk about metaverse a lot. We kind of talk about movement to the cloud. A lot of companies are being acquired right now in the gaming industry. What's your take on the industry and what, what, what is interesting to you about it? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't necessarily a industry, like it wasn't like an industry thesis, I guess. We weren't looking at it as gaming broadly. We kind of looked at each one of these companies individually and they just happened to benefit from a lot of the same tailwinds. I don't have the numbers in front of me, Brett, maybe you do, but the, the growth of the industry has certainly been um, impressive over the last decade. It sort of got a pull forward in COVID. I believe the, the projections are that it might contract a bit in 2022. Um, but it, it's, it's becoming more and more, and I think Satya and Adela said this after they acquired Activision Blizzard, it's becoming more and more software-like that these businesses, it's not, I believe EA's gross margins have doubled over the last 10 years. And a lot of that is because it's so many in-game purchases and it's no longer this physical distribution business where you can go in, you can download everything digitally. There's there's less costs associated with the publishers now. And your your the lifetime value is way beyond just the initial game purchase. So you can kind of build these ecosystems within the game and uh, take two electronic arts have done that really well. Nintendo has been a little slower, but they're sort of a unique, they don't really, they're kind of on their own. Like we want to lump them in with the big publishers, I guess since it's sort of a hardware software mix. Um, but I, I guess we, we, we like each of those businesses individually. We think they have really good intellectual property or franchises that are going to be durable and going to be around for a long time. Uh, the primary ones that I'm probably thinking of are uh, Grand Theft Auto for Take-Two or, or 2K, the, the basketball series for Take-Two. Uh, and then FIFA and Madden, as well as Apex Legends has come on really strong lately for uh, EA. Am I missing any other big ones? Uh, I mean, The Sims is very durable for EA. There's Red Dead Redemption is the other big three uh, for Take-Two. And then with Nintendo, everyone knows those brands that have been super durable. Mario, Zelda, Animal Crossing, oh gosh, and Pokemon. Po and Pokemon. Those, are yeah. the big, those are the big four. And I, yeah, I think Ryan hit on everything. Um, and then there's one other thing that we like about a lot of the gaming publishers is that games are much more social now, at least the bigger ones. Um, yeah, there's still some, you know, popular individual games. Uh, what, what's one that came out that was more in seem, I don't know this game exactly, seem more individual based was like Elden Ring or something like that. I think they have online as well. But again, some of those, you know, individual one-time player games can be very, uh, you know, lucrative if you get a hit out there. But if it's just those individual games, you kind of sell your 20 million copies or 10 million copies, and then you're done. With these social games, with these uh, perpetual franchises, you, one, have perpetual, you know, not perpetual, uh, recurring money coming in, and two, you get a locked-in player ecosystem because the social aspect means it's a winner-take-all phenomenon. When we've seen... Well, yeah. winner-take-all, really, because... FIFA had uh, decent competitors back 10, 15 years ago, but when it moved to multiplayer and they started getting the exclusive licenses from all the leagues, they didn't have a monopoly or sorry, they don't have an exclusive license on making soccer simulation games. But while they started getting all the players and all this and everything else, all the leagues, all the um, gamers as well, they've locked in with an incredible moat from the social aspect of that, all the players are on FIFA, and if you want to go play the second-rate game, there's just going to be less uh, players in your lobby to play online, and, and the experience is just so much worse. So we think that makes, again, these publishers very, very uh, uh, moody, and that's our thesis on that. But we can also talk about the industry in general. There's it, some... I was on the FIFA note, I was going to say that it has... A set, it really has become a winner-take-all because more people know FIFA as a uh, video game than FIFA as a federation, which is what it is. Um, and so as they transition away from this uh, FIFA name, I think more people are just going to associate it with EA Sports FC because it's going to be the exact same game. Um, and and the, the FIFA name might not be that relevant in five to 10 years, I would imagine. Um, wow. But 
it's really hard now once you've built up sort of that network effect among players um, to, to go and, and find it. And well, if there are competitors, uh, it's, it's hard to find one that's quite as good. And it, I think it deters a lot of competition because it's hard to pull players away from that game. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Do you have something else to add? Nope, all good. It, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm, I'm looking right now at your fund holdings, which you can check out. Anyone who's listening can check out archcapitalfund.com. Thank you for holdings. the shout out. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, put, put a little plug in there to, you know, see that you've got a, an 8%, 8.1% position in Take-Two Interactive. You've got a 7.3% uh, uh, stake in Electronic Arts, and then also that 7.3% in Nintendo. Do you think the three of those, do you look at all those the same, or is Nintendo a different beast? Because it's been traditionally, you know, the NES, the Super NES, the Switch, the Wii. You know, there's got to be a, a handheld device that they've tried to, to, I mean, is that a different beast than something like a Take-Two Interactive which is going digital? and in-game yeah, it's, de- it's, de- it's definitely different um, with the hardware model. Um, so the similarities are that margins are going up because you're getting a lot more software downloads and they're also running these, uh, they've launched these subscription services for the Nintendo Switch Online that has 30 something million at last count, probably 40 million now subscribers, which is giving them solid recurring revenue. But yes, they are a lot different because one, they're getting uh, third party revenue on the take rate from someone that sells through their devices. Um, two, they're really more on um full game sales plus digital downloads after so they're not doing recurring revenue for in-game items and stuff like that so they'll sell the pokemon game and then they may have some add-on content a year later and then third they have to get it right with hardware so when they release their new hardware which will likely be within the next well let's be conservative within the next three years they can be very patient um they got to get that right as well so there's a little more risk with nintendo and that's probably why their earnings multiples are lower there's a few more variables at play However, they probably have the best, uh, the most durable franchises that have been around since, well, most of them since the 80s. So, yep. yeah. And then my, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't think Mario or Pokemon or, or uh, Zelda are going away anytime soon. And it, it is sort of that, I think the Buffett's got a quote that, you know, Disney's, Disney's got, it's, with Disney's IP, it's like they go in, they drill out all this oil, and then it seeps back into the ground, and they pull it all out again seven years later or whatever. I, Mario and Pokemon and those games benefit from that same advantage where they, I think they just did Mario Party 8 or something like that. So, I mean, Mario Party 9 will probably be a great seller, um, and it it's just constantly iterating on those exact same franchises, and uh, that that is – a huge sort of value well that they can tap into. Yeah, and that's interesting too. I mean, you're so it seems like there's so much media coverage about Netflix and about Disney Plus, you know, streaming and you know, movies online and everything else like that. And it seems like gaming, even though it's several times, several multiple times larger than uh than the video entertainment industry is, that gaming is just so much larger, but it seems like it's still just underappreciated, especially for a company like Nintendo. Uh, oh, yeah. Catching up with those trends. Yeah. Okay. And then and then lastly on this topic, you know, before before we close this one out, I have to ask you about the uh, the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier. Is this a good deal for Microsoft? Is this a good deal for Activision? What do you guys think about this? Uh, I think it's good for both. For, well, I think Activision. It's better for Activision. It was, it was about time, probably, for a change. At Activision, um, and I, I do think this benefits the Xbox Xbox ecosystem or the Game Pass. Um, especially I know they're trying to essentially build out what is going to ultimately try to be an X or Netflix for games. Um, And this probably gives them a good content base to do that with. It's not necessarily going to be exclusive. I think the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer said, these, these games are going to stay platform agnostic. PlayStation users still going to be able to play call of duty, but it gives them good development teams to build potentially new exclusive content or just have, um, if, if they, I, I believe they've said that they're going to go, they're trying to build a console list, uh, system with, I think they've partnered with LG for smart TVs. Um, it might not be LG. Might uh, be it's someone like that. Yeah. Eventually they want to make it, I mean, it's a cross between 
we're trying to make linear video, not not linear. Uh, we're trying to make video comparisons. It's like a cross between Roku and Netflix a bit where they're trying to get like a tiny little bit of hardware that you connect to your TV. And then basically you can have this cloud gaming service, which is the ultimate holy grail. And it feels like Microsoft is the number one candidate to do that. Sony's, you know, got a lot of firepower as well. Um, Nintendo is, they do their own thing, like we mentioned. But uh, adding Activision on there it's just a fantastic asset to have. Plus it generates a lot of cash. Yeah, they, they paid a hefty price for it, but they had been in a tough slump. Um, and I think this acquisition will free them up. One, from the blizzard woes. Two, from the executive woes. Both, you know, the sexual harassment stuff that had really bogged down the company for obvious reasons. They had such a such a big problem with that. And then second, they had been milking. Eh, maybe milking is the wrong word. They had been possibly overdoing it with Call of Duty with a game release every year. And they've announced that they're actually going to do uh, take, I believe, 2023 off, um, which, you know, that's a huge, the biggest, this is the biggest franchise in gaming. So that is just, I think it, it will free the, it'll, it'll, yeah, they'll lose a bit of, you know, earnings in the short run, but over the long term, under the Microsoft umbrella, they're going to be uh, at a much more flexible to be able to do what's in best for the long-term health of those franchises, if you get what I mean. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is the, the the Microsoft umbrella affords them a lot of flexibility and time to go out and produce the absolute best games, regardless of putting them on like a time schedule. Whereas you, because yeah, they'll probably still. I mean, you still want them to earn money, but their earnings are pretty much irrelevant to Microsoft's, or they're just such a tiny portion that no one really cares so you've got the now the ability to really get the xbox right with having to meet without having to meet quarterly deadlines or you have the ability to get your content right without having to meet quarterly deadlines i think that's a big advantage for a lot of developers i think that's a lot of it's probably something a lot of developers like is the flexibility that microsoft i imagine can grant them now nintendo does that same thing but they just don't care about uh what the shareholders think in the short run, which you could bid as a positive or a negative. They'll, they'll delay his game in, as long as they want, um, which, you know, that's that Japanese mindset. So it's a little bit different. You have that. That's a huge pull and uh, give and take you have in, in the video game market. I do think it's, uh, I think it's a good acquisition. I also think it will go through. I am, well, I Mr. No regulatory like, lawyer, lawyer here. <laughs> I, mean, I guess I'm not a regulatory lawyer and I probably have no edge on that, but it's, it's not, it's not anti-competitive. It doesn't make Xbox a monopoly. Um, so I, I don't know how it wouldn't benefit the consumer, which I think I'm once again, not a regulatory lawyer, but I imagine that's one of the points that uh, is, is pretty important in assessing that deal. Yeah. And to be fair, Microsoft has played well with the regulators. So all things considered, you know, whether that's cloud, whether that's social, whether that's gaming, they, they seem like they, stay a little bit less out of the crosshairs than a lot of their other competitors. Yeah. I think even if the, yeah, even if they are doing similar things, maybe yeah. they, they have just a better reputation at least right now. And the cultural stuff too, there's no doubt they're going to clean a lot of that up, but you know, it was a real problem for Activision for so many years. Maybe one of the other things that, that I'll be at least interested in as an investor is whether Microsoft can improve the relationship as a publisher of the games with the creators of the games themselves, right? Act Activision had problems with this, terrible problems with this for years, right? They lost uh, Destiny, you know, which was created with Bungie because of kind of a culture mix match. And it was just, in addition to the sexual harassment and all that stuff that, that was already exposed at Activision, just really a brutal culture of deadlines. And it wasn't a whole lot of fun. The, the talent and the developers didn't love that. Uh, they missed League of Legends, you know, it was the other big game out there, you know, created by Epic Games, not by Activision. As big as Activision was, it seemed like there was continually looking at the rearview mirror of, you know, how many more World of Warcraft expansions can they make? How many more Call of Duty expansions can they make versus creating the next big thing? To me, it'll be really interesting if Microsoft can partner with the right companies that have the talent to make those games, fold it right into Game Pass and be a step ahead rather than a step behind. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm also kind of excited to see what other consolidation we see in the industry. This is something that there's uh, a rumor your, about electronic arts. Yeah. Your, your colleague and our friend Matt Cochran has mentioned is when, 
this is the great time to, if you've been thinking about getting into the video game publishing business, whether you're, I mean, I feel like everyone at big tech has kind of dabbled with the idea. Plus, yeah, it's, plus the media companies too. Yeah, it's a good time to buy a big publisher because you can piggyback off that Activision deal because unless someone buys EA at a huge premium, <clears throat> it's not going to be bigger than Activision. So um, it pretty much gives you the regulatory green light to go do it if they say yes to Microsoft and Activision. And that's something that, something that Matt brought up. Um, and I, I, think, I think there's a lot of brands that people would, or media companies or big tech companies would want to acquire by purchasing either a Take-Two or a, a yeah. EA. And if you look at the meta platforms or otherwise known as Facebook, they're trying to be the ones disrupting with the new VR platform with Oculus and uh, you know tons of hardware that they've come out with over the last few years and plan on doing for the next five years. That, you know, these, these publishers could be a huge strategic asset for someone to buy, even if it's not Electronic Arts and Take-Two Interactive, there are a ton of other smaller studios that they could go after and probably want to go after, but, you know, Facebook isn't allowed to do all that regulatory stuff. So that's interesting as well. Um, and actually, if the VR becomes uh, the next big thing, that is a little bit of a risk for the publishers uh, because you have to be able to, you know, execute on getting over to the, you know, the VR software development platforms, um, winning those same consumers if they transition from the Xbox, PlayStation, PC systems over to the, the VR one. But that's more of a long-term threat that, yeah, maybe investors should just, track uh ever so often yeah and not to mention the advertising too right we talked about the upfront sale of the software the in-game purchases when you've got a platform that's got maybe a billion users on it that you can start putting plugging a game into and have a reduced cost that's advertising supported we know that the big get bigger in that game and that's certainly an advantage for the microsoft's of the world and the larger companies exactly um the last thing i would put out is there's been a lot of reports and it hasn't been the number one news item uh, but there is a projection now that the global games and services market from one of these third party analysts is actually going to contract 1.2% this year. Uh, and there's been, you know, people in the industry have written about how this makes it maybe, you know, video games aren't recession proof. Um, is the, did the industry peak in 2021? At first, I was a little concerned about that because typically the industry has grown at about, I think it's like eight to 10% a year for the last few decades. However, I, I think it's just a little bit of a timing issue. One, you know, during COVID, there was a, you know, catalyst and a little bit of an artificial boost to things. And we're comping against that now, which makes it really tough. Two, uh, the timing of game sales. Uh, it's just, it, sometimes the cycle works out. We had a lot of big games uh, at the beginning of this year. The game slate for the rest of the year is pretty light. I mean, for example, if Call of Duty comes off the market for one of the years like they're planning on doing, which hasn't been the case for the last at least decade plus, that will probably make the industry look worse, even though at the Pacific level for a company that's not Activision publishing that, um, nothing will really change and it might actually be a benefit for them. So if we are in a recession right now and a consumer wallets are a little tighter and the industry only declines by 1%, in my mind, I think that's pretty recession proof, especially given the code comp that we're going under. Also, I imagine that encapsulates hardware sales and- Oh, right. Forgot about that. Been, the, the chip shortage has put pressure on supply for a lot of those console makers. Uh, Nintendo included. PlayStation has talked about how they just cannot meet demand um, despite having record demand for their new PlayStations. And when um, you buy a console, you buy at least one game, so. Yeah, and so it's just like, if you were thinking, if you're like, oh, you know, I, I might upgrade to the next Xbox, maybe I hold off buying that game until I get it. I, I think a lot of people are probably in that boat. And so between what Brett mentioned with the timing and this chip shortage uh, associated with the console makers, I guess it's not too surprising to think that th there would be some contraction this year. But I imagine as the next gen consoles um, are in all the households around the world that have that game, uh, we'll start to see that return on spending or return into growth uh, for spending across the industry. Makes a lot of sense, guys. Well, I have you here one last outro question, which is that there are a lot of headlines and there are a lot of headwinds facing the economy right now. We It seems like every single day you hear about inflation and interest rates. Um, certainly these are things that we shouldn't just brush aside and, and not think about. 
but we do like to think as long-term investors, you know, how they're going to impact us. Anything that's impacting your investing right now, anything that's on your mind that you'd like to share with our audience uh, who are long-term investors that, that maybe we should be considering about what's going on in economy or macro or anything else in the financial media? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there are a lot of headwinds, the uh, cost headwinds, inflation, like you just mentioned. And I like to think of it more proactively when looking at a company and say, okay, does this company have a huge labor wage risk? Um, and this is from an investor perspective. So say you look at Starbucks, you look at a restaurant operator, you look at someone like that. From say my personal perspective, you know, you'd like employees to get good wages, right? But as an investor perspective, now you want to make sure everyone in your, every stakeholder you have is getting the value. But I would much rather invest in a company that doesn't have that risk at all. So that's kind of something I look at. If there is this wage stuff that continues, yeah, it's probably a good thing for society. But as an investor, I just want you know a company that, for whatever reason, ha has avoided it, either because they're digital, I don't know, they're a, they're a payment something or whatever. Yeah, I, I guess I haven't really thought about it from the macro lens, but I have just started to like hone in more or, or be interested more on the more asset light business models, the ones that don't have to have huge workforces or um, see potential wage pressure. Uh, and even like the really, really good brands are starting to have difficulty with that. Starbucks is kind of one that comes to mind where there's been the unionizing and, and the, I guess, pushback from baristas that you could have the best brand and you could be known for being a good place to work. But when times get tough, it's not, it's just a risk that some of the more asset like businesses don't have to face. Great points. So well, once again, Brett Schaefer and Ryan Henderson are the hosts of the podcast Chit Chat Money. Uh, they're our partner here with Seven Investing. They're also the portfolio managers of Arch Capital. Look at the stock market every day. Also have that same long-term investing lens. Uh, Brett and Ryan, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining me for the podcast this afternoon. Yep. Thanks, Simon. This was a fun discussion. Always glad to talk. Definitely is always a pleasure having you guys on our show. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of our Seven Investing Podcast. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are Seven Investing. <laughs>